Okay, La Casa, now I'll go uh, uh, just oh. At this time, I'd like to welcome our first uh, uh, speaker, or our second speaker, sorry, a preeminent advocate for the preservation and the restoration of Aboriginal midwifery, and a major voice for environmental and reproductive justice. Gudji is a beloved Native woman, a leader, and an elder. Gudji serves on the Elders Council of the Indigenous Justice Division under the Senator Justice Murray Sinclair. She's an Indispire Health Award recipient in 2016, and just an incredible woman with so much wisdom, and uh, I don't, I'm at a loss for words, so I'd like to welcome Gudji Cook. Fifteen minutes, okay. Okay, My name is Gaji Cook, and I'm so pleased to be here to participate in the launch of the Indigenous Health Professions Program. Um, a lot of what we're talking about in truth and reconciliation movements in Canada, to me, we began in uh, a long time ago um, in our communities through revitalizing uh, the energies of the women uh, and in establishing the College of Midwives of Ontario and the National Aboriginal Council of Midwives the Freestanding Birthing Center, the first in Canada at the Chihinue Hyunagalatsta Onagrasta uh, in Six Nations, uh, Ontario, and now the uh, Indigenous Framework Birthing Center in Toronto, where a lot of our young Aboriginal midwives graduating out of the three baccalaureate programs that we established can precept under Indigenous pra practitioners. So I want to share with you a story because we are at this unusual spectrum of ancient knowledge, of historic experience, and the contemporary challenges that we face. And so I want to begin um, to share with you uh, a phenomenon of birth coming out of my community about 30 years ago in that transitional moment, that doorway to this revision of systems in Canada that is a leader in the world. Uh, just jurisdictions in Australia, New Zealand, Africa, our, uh, uh, South America are looking at the work that's being done in Canada with Aboriginal midwifery. So I want to uh, share with you this story that um, highlights those elements of um, the restoration of meaning uh, through cultural symbols and practice. So that the holism of this birth story enfolds the congruency of birth, dream, and ceremony, and illustrates the potency of dream as a vehicle for empowerment and connection at the threshold a psychological space of the Iroquois ceremonial complex. I share this story um, situated in acts in the larger scheme of purpose and meaning of our Ongwehoeneha, our indigenous ways of knowing and being. About 25 years ago, uh, during an initial prenatal visit, which for me uh, can last three hours, um, I asked the Wagelakwa, uh, what has your family taught you about birth? And it took her a while to sift through the files of memory when she landed on an uncle, a maternal uncle, who had passed away several years before. Clearly, he was the most significant male in her early development. She said, when I was 15 years old, my uncle Mahis, a great man, and a wise Bear Clan chief in the Oka Longhouse said, our people die at birth, for they are no longer born the way Mother Nature intended. The birth is always hurried, and women's stomachs are cut open. 
Drugs are used that make babies born half asleep. The first words they hear is the tongue of a foreign man. Then he's tossed from nurse to nurse, washed and measured and tested. Then he's placed on his mother's breast if he's lucky. That's why our ways are dying. There's no respect in the pain women feel at childbirth, the only time that the pain of life can be associated with joy. The following spring, months later, on the night when she went into labor, Dewagyalakwa had gathered her family, her loved ones, and conducted a full moon ceremony at a fire near the driveway just outside her kitchen door. Sacred tobacco, water, and song were offered to the fire, earth, and moon, while her clan relatives and friends expressed their sincerest words for a safe journey for her and her coming child in our Mohawk language. After sitting at her kitchen table, finishing up a ceremonial feast, a fierce storm suddenly kicked up outside. I was sitting in front of an open kitchen window when a great gust of wind came blasting past me down into the hallway, into the room where she planned to give birth. People were quickly back outside, closing car windows, and I heard someone shout, watch that fire, it might catch the cars. The wind was so powerful that the big drops of rain could not extinguish it. Upon entering her room to catch the flailing curtains and close the open windows, I could see the fire outside dancing in the wind. The wind was so strong I couldn't even leave the, opens, the windows open a slight crack. I closed it completely as people jumped in their cars and took off for the refuge of their homes. In the middle of the chaos, the woman was feeling uncomfortable with contractions, so I sent her into a warm shower with only a night light on in the washroom to promote her relaxation. A while later, after calm was restored to the household, she came out and settled into her bed. She was in active labor and soon began to push. It was a lovely scene. Jessica, may I have some water, please? The woman's mother was beside me, waiting to receive the baby in a new deerskin. The room was darkened and we kept quiet. During an especially hard contraction, the woman grasped a small turtle shell rattle of the kind used in the seed blessing rite of the Duisa Society, the Women Planter Society, of our Mohawk longhouse. With each swell of the heavy contractions, she took the small turtle rattle and grasped it in her hand. The gourd rattle, or small turtle rattle, that is used in the germinal rite of the march of the women planters in the spring, finds symbolic significance in women's ovaries, fluid, and rain necessary for growth and ritual performance. The privileged cultural knowledge and ritual praxis of the Doisa Society is part of a larger constellation of procreative practices of our longhouse women tied to the maintenance of the gardens and the matrilineal group. Entering through the logic of ceremonial practice, the seed itself is singing to the singer of the song in a dance of reciprocal consciousness, complexly interwoven into indigenous concepts of reproductive power. The root language of the expressions within the song evokes seeds of consciousness having to do with fertility, procreation, and the oronta, or sacred power of women. The songs may be used in calling the young girl into womanhood, in reconstructed puberty rites to meet the needs of preconception care. Here, my client applied her experience of ritual performativity to call her baby to its birth. One particular line, gahuino, gahuio, gahuine. Gahuio, gahuine, gahuio, gahuine, 
Kahuiyo, kahuine, kahuiyo, kahuine, means nice canoe coming. Encoding the female labia and troitus and is used to indicate the journey of the child contained in his mother's sacred vessel. Midwife Ina Mae Gaskin reminds us that contemporary society forgets that we give birth with our sex organs. This essential separation of human society from nature is the challenge of practitioners in navigating the psychosexual space of her client. Indigeneity of birth, or at the heart of what is described as traditional birth practices, is expressed in the enchantment. In the enchantment, there is a timelessness such that all that ever was or ever will be is already available to us. Upon my day one visit after a successful home birth, I found the Wagalakwa in a state of euphoria. After she had given birth to a healthy boy, she had fallen asleep and had a compelling dream. Elated, she told me. I had forgotten what I had experienced in the intensity of my birth, but when I fell asleep, everything came back to me in a dream. Do you remember when you sent me into the shower? I was standing in that shower, having a hard time thinking, I can't do this. Standing there, I remembered that when I was only a couple of months pregnant, I went to a seer. They told me my baby was going to be born in a thunderstorm. Everyone waited so long for me to actually go into labor that I kept thinking, when is this thunderstorm going to come? In the shower, I began to feel the whole house shaking. I thought, Maybe it's my husband and brother-in-law shaking the house to make me think there's a thunderstorm, so I'll go into labor. Then I realized you couldn't shake a house that easy. Then it occurred to me that when the false faces come into your home after midwinter ceremony, they come in with their big turtle shell rattles pounding the floor and they're dancing and the whole house shakes. For a minute I thought, it must be them, the grandfathers. Then, just when I thought I couldn't do this anymore, I turned in my shower. Standing there, I saw my uncle Mahisa's face. He was standing in a field of green grass against a blue sky with white puffy clouds. There was a light around his eyes and forehead. He spoke to me in Ganyangeha, encouraging me and giving me the strength I needed to know that I could do this. Just when I felt my baby move down through my bones. Just then, when I came out of the bathroom in my dream, I walked into my bedroom and saw a wall of fire burning outside where our tobacco fire had been. The wind picked the fire up out of the earth. It was very powerful. When I was in my bed pushing my baby out, do you remember that moment? When I yelled, she asked. I remember her yell. It rose from her depths as she lifted her buttocks off the bed, letting loose energy from her throat like the great gust of wind that had blown through the window the night before. She continued, when my breath left my mouth, it went into the room. It circled the room and came back into me through my ear. and went down into my body where my baby was. You know how they say when you die there's a light at the end of a tunnel? Well, that's what I saw, a light at the end of a tunnel. That must have been my flashlight, I said, a life before birth experience. She continued. You know how you can hear underwater when you're swimming? She asked. Well, that's what I heard. I could hear people talking like we were talking underwater. I could hear everything my baby heard, and I could see everything my baby saw. I felt a great peace. I knew my baby was okay. And when he was born, I was born, she exclaimed excitedly. 
I'm never going to be the same. For so long, I have let the white man tell me who I am and what we must do. I'm not going to live my life that way anymore because I now know we can do this. I'm not going to go one more day not speaking my language. I'm not going to go one more day letting the white man define who I am and who we are as a people. When a birthing mother awakens to her personal power, when her mind, body, and spirit converge in an elegant display of her personal aronda or inspiritedness, this is the moment when life grasps hold of purpose. Five years later, setting up my equipment in the same home of the same family in their bedroom, I noticed standing by the doorway was the now five-year-old whose birth I had attended that many years before. I could feel him studying me as I strategically positioned my supplies. I imagined that it's not often that a small boy sees cord clamp, portable oxygen, oxygen tank, and other birthing supplies being placed carefully in his parents' bedroom. Fluent in both Mohawk and English, the little boy said to me, Guhyayale. I remember you. I remember your hands. Creation is like this. We can remember what we once forgot by pulling on a thread that reveals to us the whole that connects everything. Within this complexity, we encounter the symmetries of continuous creation that can penetrate and transform. So the, for the purpose of strengthening your own spirit at this historic moment of the launch of the Indigenous Health Professions Program here at McGill University, the Harvard of Canada, I want to ask you each to get comfortable in the seat where you are. Get that wisp of hair out of your face and fix that wedgie. <laughs> and allow yourself to surrender to the sound of the current of your own breath. Let the niggling thoughts and external intrusion lift you from your mind so that you might hear the voice of your own powerful spirit. It will help to close your eyes so that you don't focus on me. I'm not here to entertain you. This song is to the four beings mentioned uh, in the Thanksgiving address and was written by Bear Fox of our Bunungwe Council. The words ask the four beings at the four directions of the cosmos to help us, to help our families. Kaeli Nungwe Da Ke Awantu Kaan Sayata nu na ne aqua waji le a want to come, a squayana was a yo ho hana yo e a he yo ho hana yo e a he yo ha yo yo ha yo hana yo e a he yo ho hana yo e a he
to this place where we share together at this celebratory moment. My radical hope and deep optimism is that the Indigenous Health Professions Program will this day launch into the world more love, compassion, and kindness. Yeah. Done it all. <laughs> 